Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Greetings to our honored guests, the former presidents as named. Greetings to all of the distinguished guests as identified by our hosts. And of course, a special greeting to all of the Fundi members of the team and the leadership. Thank you for the privilege to address you. We've just looked at that video. Ubuntu used to sound and feel like what we've just seen and heard. And have you ever wondered why things changed and whether education has anything to do with it? Former President Nelson Mandela, whose centenary we celebrate this year, together with the centenary of Mama Albertina Sisulu, once said, education is the most powerful weapon with which we can use to change the world. But to change the world for what? Everything we are, everything we believe in, Everything we do is because of how we were educated. Sometimes the education was conscious, sometimes the education was unconscious. We've just seen one lesson from the wild, the elephants showing us something similar to Ubuntu. I am because you are. Your survival is tied up with my survival. I will help you because if I don't, my own survival is also threatened. But how do elephants end up like that? They are educated. My original video was going to be a clip from the movie Born in China. Watch it. It's a movie that shows you that animals are educated to know how to find food, to know how to belong, how to behave properly, to stay in the group. And if you can't behave properly, you know you're going to be kicked out. To know how to defend yourself as an individual and to know how to work with the group to defend the entire group. As you saw the elephants defending the one group of elephants from the lions. But what's the why of our education today? Fundi has brought us here to look at how disruptive technology can be used to advance education. But education for what? During colonialism, education in Africa was for Africans to fit in with their place within the colonial setup. But because Africa was not industrialized, the colonial setup still left you alone to fend for yourself. Hence, we know about Charlotte McClaige, who, as the first black woman to get a degree, still naturally became an entrepreneur because she had the social education from her family, that her family had never worked for others, it had always fended for itself. We have Pixley Gaseme working with the people in Bumalanga to buy a farm and be able to fend for themselves and to sell the surplus. You have um, other starting newspapers. You have a whole lot of people in the past that were entrepreneurs. My father himself was an entrepreneur. After he stopped working because he was sick for a year, and then he was let go off without any pension. But he didn't stand with a placard saying, I'm unemployed. He didn't have that option. He became self-employed, one of the founders of what we know today as the taxi industry. It started with vans, where people were at the back of the van with a canopy and sitting on benches. He was one of the founders of what we know as a puzzle shop today, just creating a container at that stage, mobile containers, selling whatever people needed, from apples, sweets, 
oranges and vegetables. But former President Nelson Mandela was right that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Because Fairfoot did use education in this country to change the psyche forever. If you look at what people did when they had no jobs before 1948, and what people did after 1948, you can see the difference between those like my father, who wasn't even educated formally, but social education, and people educated after 1948. You can look at Africa, you can look at the continent before industrialization, how people were educated and why we ended up with the Kwame Nkrumahs. And then you ask yourself, the education we have today, whether digitalized or not, what is it for? Is it creating people who can find food for themselves, as it is the case in the world? Is it creating people who can be useful members who belong to a community, to a country, who don't harm members of a community, who actually protect members of the community? Is it creating members who help members of the community to defend themselves against challenges that may be dangerous out there? I'm not sure. Which leads to the question right now, what in the third attempt at the African Renaissance, Kwame Nkrumah was among the pioneers of the idea of an Africa that was going to rise be a glorious continent, respected, and contributing meaningfully to the global change. And indeed, things started happening because of the vision of people like Kwame Nkrumah. We ended up with the whole continent being liberated from colonialism, with South Africa ending up being the last but one country where there was colonialism of a special type. And I'm saying it's last but one because we still have Western Sahara that remains a, con a colony of Morocco, which is another country in our continent. So, but talking about now, the second dawn of Africa, sometimes young people ask, are we having a dawn? Are we really having the Renaissance? Or is it a dusk being mistaken for a dawn? Agenda 2063 told us that we are re-imagining Africa. We're making a commitment to Krumah that the next 50 years will be better than the first 50 years. But by 2063, Africa will be the Africa of our dreams, where everyone's potential will be freed, everyone's life will be improved. There will be technology used by everyone. Nobody would have to do unnecessary manual labor. Nobody would be unemployed. Nobody would suffer from diseases or die from diseases that are curable. And the infrastructure would be amazing, and Africa would be a giant and equal among other continents. As part of that Agenda 2063 was a dream that this continent would never hear a gun by 2020, which is almost about an, a year from now. And linked to that with various things that were going to be done as part of Agenda 2063, preparing the road for us to achieve that dream of a functional continent. African free trade area is one of those things that are about leveraging our collective wisdom, our collective resources, human and otherwise, to take this continent forward by breaking the borders between our continents, freeing goods, freeing people, freeing knowledge to roam within the continent. And apart from the group things that the continent is doing, we've seen this continent rising. We've seen M-Pesa impressing the world. 
We've seen, please call me. We've seen various innovations that have been done by this continent that have shown the way to the world. I mean, the first heart transplant was done in Africa, here in, in South Africa, Ruteske Hospital, by Professor, or by Dr. Chris Barnett. The movie industry, when it was still silent, motion pictures came from this continent. And there are many others. But the concern around whether we're having a dawn or a dusk is because we had the first wave of the African Renaissance, the, the Nkrumah time. Then we had the second wave when President Mbegi and others started to remind us again that we are African and we should be proud of that. And suddenly, Agenda 2063, the AU came up with Agenda 2063. But regardless of Agenda 2063, and regardless of the great work that is done by our colleagues from Fundi, we are in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution and at the door of the fifth industrial revolution. What saddens me, and it should sadden you too, colleague, is we are consumers of the fourth industrial revolution. At the beginning of this year, one of the PAs at our University of Stellenbosch told me excitedly, we were asked this year at my son's school not to buy any books, not to buy any textbooks, exercises, etc. And all that I was asked to buy for my son is a Samsung tablet. That's a product from Korea. That school is deciding that from here onwards, it's tied up to Korea. But it's tying me and you also to Korea because our foreign exchange is linked to that. And there's nothing wrong with that. China decided to digitalize, but the difference between China and what happened at that school is that when China decided to digitalize, it looked at what the West was doing. And it sent its engineers, its technicians, and others to go to the West, to go to Norway, to go to Harvard, MIT, and etc., to learn how to do these things. It also attracted experts from those countries to come to China and create products. And it digitalized in an indigenous way. It's not all gloom and doom, though. I know that there are efforts that are done in Kenya. I'm, I've been told that Kenya is creating an African computer and an African tablet. I've been told that here, with the help of the HSRC, there are thoughts around creating an African computer, an African tablet, and etc. cetera. Um, so it's not that bad. What saddens me, though, is that up until now, we've only been producing apps. And of course, it's a good thing but up still need to go into technology created elsewhere. Then we also have procurement, particularly state procurement that is not commission-centric. The example I gave from China is an example that I experienced when I attended one of the World Economic Forum GECs, that is Global Advisory Committees. I was in, in the one on transparency and anti-corruption. And uh, Saudi Arabia, just said they had a lot of money, but not to procure goods and services. They said they had money to procure. No, it wasn't Saudi Arabia, sorry. It's just Saudi Arabia has been in the media for the wrong reasons, for the killing of a journalist. <laughs> yes. No, uh, this was UAE. So they, they announced that they had this fund where anybody from anywhere in the world can come to the UAE, and they had decided what products they wanted created for the industrial technology, I mean, uh, for the industrial revolution technology. So that's commissioning as opposed to procuring. But you decide, you now want your education to be digitalized. 
you want uh, 3D printing for education and all of these things. But do you decide to commission the production of technology for that? Or do you sign a big deal with other countries so that you can just order a whole lot of things from them? You've got to think very carefully about that. We have a lot of our people left behind. Technology has the ability to include, if properly used, and it has the ability to exclude that, those that are already excluded. And the same thing is with education. Education can increase disparities in society, and it can reduce them. Just, just a short story about two girls, all of them from Soweto. All of them were 13 around, okay, one was 12-ish, the other one was 13 around June 16. The one wasn't arrested because her parents sent her to a neighboring state to study. And because of bursaries, she was studying for free in one of the best schools, what in South Africa would call a Model C school, but one of the top schools in that neighboring state. And a mixed racial school as well at the time, and therefore she, she experienced living in a diverse society where you're not afraid of another race and you feel like a, you're an equal with anybody from any race, from any gender. The other one was 13 on June 16. She was arrested for fighting for the democracy that we, me and you, those of us who are South Africans, enjoy today. She was harassed, she was beaten up, and her education was arrested in the process. Today, that one, the 13-year-old, today, she sells some cheap cosmetics from the East. Some days those cosmetics are bought, some days nobody buys them, and she goes without any food. But every day she goes to Constitution Hill to sell these and also to tell tourists about what happened in order them to understand the fabric of our society. But she's poor. She's also disabled. Uh, she has suffered mental health because of what happened to her during apartheid. Her daughter can't go to university because there are limited places in universities. Many African countries will send you to another country at government expense if the universities are full. We're not yet doing that. Unless you get it better from a department, but it's not an NSFS arrangement. So education can change people's lives. The one that went to a neighboring state, got an education, uh, some state she left school, came back, taught at home, and just decided to be a comrade, and parents kept saying, no, don't be a comrade, just be an education, you can come back, do your education, you can come back and be a comrade later. She eventually went back, got his, her law degree, worked as a trade unionist, worked in government, worked in civil society, and eventually, she became the public protector and is now a law professor. <laughs> the other girl, though, Balisa Musa, is asking the question, we fought for democracy. We fought for freedom. Instead, we got democracy. I don't want democracy anymore. Because during apartheid, the past prevented me from going wherever I wanted, from living up to my full potential. But today, poverty is doing what the past was doing in the past. There wasn't a tear in the room when we met Balisa Musa at Constitution Hill last year. In the end, the women in the room, of all, from all age groups, all racial categories, uh, donated 7,000 to just help her. And in the process, we are formulating a strategy to look at how can we lift her? How can we make sure that she is not part of that statistics that says between 
90 and 95 percent of people who are born into poverty are going to produce children who are going to be poor, and those children are also going to produce grandchildren who are poor. And that is poverty cycle. In South Africa, the Constitution promises everyone's freed potential. And how can you have a freed potential when there's no social mobility? But incidentally, the promise that is being given to South Africans by the South African Constitution is the same promise that Nkrumah gave to Africans in that inaugural speech of the African Union. That no child should be trapped in poverty. And that education was going to be the tool to liberate every child. But back to where we are, our education is still a little bit trapped in where it was when we found it. I'm talking about the pillars of the education as opposed to who teaches today. And the teachers are mostly in Africa are black and a mixed, you know, they reflect the caliber of Africa. You'll find black, white, Indian, and Asian. Um, but the quality of that education is it freeing the mind? Is it creating citizens that can take this continent forward? And then other problems that we have, there's so many extremism now, refugee problem, etc. But just generally for me, what I have found is what the Mo Ibrahim Index says today the Mo Ibrahim Index for 2018 was released today. And they found that there's a dissonance between the education we give and the outcomes we want. We have not reconciled our education system with the outcome we want. Again, if you go to China, children are taught at an early age coding because we live in the digital age so every child, not some children, every child is being prepared to live in the digital. Just as elephants are taught to live in the elephant world, every elephant must fit in, must get maximum benefit from living in the elephant world, but also must give maximum value to the group they belong to. Seemingly, in our case, according to the Mo Ibrahim Index, things are getting worse in Africa in terms of content. We could complain and blame African governance, and there are former presidents among us here, so we don't have to go too far to find the people to point fingers at. But there's an African proverb that says, a leopard is chasing us, and you're asking me, is it male or female? <laughs> so that's what we'll be doing to ourselves. The reality is here we are, and this is the situation, and Funda has brought us, Fundi has brought us here to say, how do we take the process forward? Because at Tuma we say, if you want a particular set of outcomes, the next move is always yours. And the Fundi way you've seen in the videos and in the songs from the young people is, is all in our hands as Madiba once said. So no blaming anybody, but working together, collaborating. From our side, for example, at, at, at Stellenbosch University and with colleagues in the social justice sector, we've come up with a Marshall Plan on social justice. And we're hoping that we can sell this idea of having a Marshall Plan for Africa. I know the EU has created a Marshall Plan for Africa. That's fine. But I think we need one that is home-brewed and home-conceptualized and home-designed because it has to be the Marshall Plan that creates the Africa we want. Resonant with Agenda 2063, resonant with our own needs in terms of the Sustainable Development Goals, and resonant with the National Development Plans of each of our countries. At the Tumor Foundation, also we say we're not going to blame anyone, but we know that part of the problem is democracy. So Palisa Musa says, democracy is not working for me. It's, it's, she's 
one of many who believe democracy is not working for one. Hence, we have extremism. Even if it doesn't translate into terrorism, it's extremism when people are going to ban an ambulance. It's extremism when people are going to doi doi every day and blockade uh, pathways to work. They are saying democracy is not working for me, and if it's not, it shouldn't work for anyone else. At the Human Foundation, we work on a system called DART, Democracy Dialogues and Democracy Voices. Just get the people to talk, get the people to understand that democracy is a malleable concept that you can work with democracy. It doesn't look the way it used to look like in Athens, 5th BC Athens. It doesn't look like African democracy before Athens copied from it. So we can change it to make sure that it works for everyone. We do advocacy, we do access to justice, to services, and we do training on a different kind of leadership than the one you see. It's called epic leadership. Leadership that is ethical, purpose-driven, impact-conscious, and committed to self. But can disruptive innovations yield education that's attuned to Africa's current and future needs? That's definitely true. Because we've seen it happening in China. One of our Harvard case studies was Kungshan, a rural city in China that decided this is what it wants to look like. They, even, they draw even a painting. They use technology to paint in concrete terms what the future is going to look like. Then they align education, so it is attuned education, technology, environmental thing, the design of the villages, to the future that they want. So I, I truly do believe, and I, as you believe, uh, that disruptive innovations can yield um, the education that we need, but also they can make education more accessible to everyone. Here are some of the key studies. Fundi, my favorite is Africa Teen Geeks. Have you heard about it? Started by a young lady, I think she's barely 22. Africa Teen Geeks, Google, instead of complaining that we're consumers of the fourth industrial revolution, this young lady, Lindy, has started Africa Teen Geeks. It goes to young kids, particularly rural ones, and teaches them coding and, and uh, uh, a design of um, um, robots and things like that, robotics and things like that. So that's the way it goes. It's possible. Well, me and you don't have to start Africa Teen Geeks. We can just donate to Africa Teen Geeks. That's all that we're asked to do. And um, Dublin Conference. There's a conference I attended in Dublin where I, I presented a, a, a speech at a conference. I was fascinated by the fact that we were sitting there in Dublin at the embassy. There, was a, there were people at the conference there. At, uh, in, uh, in Zambia, there were people having a conference and, and in other countries as well. But the same technology can be leveraged to make sure that historically advantaged universities, wherever they are in the world, could be MIT, could be Harvard, it could be Stellenbosch, could be Wurz, can sit in the same class with students anywhere in the world and experience the same feeling that others experience. Be able to ask questions, because it's not a one-way thing. It's the thing where everyone, the speaker speaks, and those, uh, uh, wherever you are, you can put a question. So technology can be leveraged. Um, character building games, I, I think we, do, we need to do more though. I don't know an African game, you know? I just know Warcraft, you know, and all of those things that kids do. But they're important, Harry Potter, games, etc. Lovely movies. Um, my kids used to love a movie called Mulan. You know, they watched it a million times. But if you look at my daughter today, how she's been shaped by movies like Mulan. Books that she read about Queen Zinger. If somebody could do a movie about Queen Zinger, hopefully young girls, she was the most powerful woman leader in this continent, uh, the warrior princess of Angola. And it's a nickname for my daughter because when she was small, it took an American white woman to buy a book 
for my daughter on Queen Zinga. And we were showing them Mulan, <laughs> which is still good. But I'm saying in this community, we can create these movies, games that teach young people their own value, that teach them how they can contribute to the Africa we want, but also make them feel that they are equal to the world. Um, social media, democracy, I mean, a whole lot of people are doing democracy products in social media. We do a lot of that in terms of demologues. And uh, this Move SA, which has been done by a young, uh, a, a young kid, Sean Nell, just gets people to talk about who you are. Where, where do you come from? And it teaches you about the other person so that you don't judge a person until you know where they've been. I could tell you where he's been, I could tell you some, with some other people. And then we've got a, pro, a, a project at, at Tuma, run, uh, which will be run with the help of Stellenbosch University. It's called Siakana Enterprising Communities, getting communities to lift them up. Why is this linked to educational priorities and linked to uh, technology? It's because in those schools, where we're piloting now, we're piloting at Emanzimeleni near Mbangeni. It's a deep rural area. So we're, part we're partnering with Africa Team Geeks. They've selected one school there where these children, who some of them have never touched a computer before, now get to do programming. But imagine if we were to do more of that. Um, we learned when we did this Siakana Enterprising Communities, when we gave computers to kids at Nondo Primary School as part of our enterprising communities, that it's not enough to give kids computers if you don't bring the social education. And not just give them basic computer skills, give them the same computer skills that kids in advanced schools are getting. As we use education to prepare for the Africa we want, let's also not forget ethics. And I can't end, end a talk without going back to African fables, because I am, because I am what I am because of partly my religious background. I was raised as a Seventh-day Adventist, as a Methodist, Zion Christian. Well, it's a long story. It was. I, I was Seventh-day Adventist, my grandmother was Methodist, and she insisted that on Sunday we should go to the Methodist school. And because our parents lived here and were living in Swaziland, they, we often had no food. And so we had an aunt who would never give us food unless we went to church with her. <laughs> so in the afternoon on Sunday, we went to the Zion Christian Church. Um, so that's how I learned my ethics. But another way of learning ethics in Africa was always storytelling. Nobody did tell you that they were teaching ethics. They just told you a story. And I'll tell you one story. I was going to tell two, but I'm going to tell only one. The story of Gimba. Gimba is a guy who was sent to go and collect food and, uh, from another village because people in his own village were starving. He goes because he was trusted, he was strong and he was trustworthy, and with the hope that when he comes back, he's going to marry a princess. He went, he got the food, and after getting the food, but he was starving, so they fed him a bit because he had come from a starving village. So he got those bundles and bundles of food, and he now went from village one to, uh, uh, to back to his own village, to, from village two back to village one. Whilst on the way, Gimba got hungry, so that's need in ethics, got hungry and ate a bit of the food. But the food was so nice, and Gimba kept eating and eating and eating the food until he finished all the food. So Gimba went back to his own village, village number one, and he got a hero's welcome because they, he stepped up. He went and he, he dared to go and he, he braved the animals, the elements and everything. So he got a hero's welcome and everything was prepared for him to marry the princess. He told them that uh, when he went to the other village, by the time he got there, the food was finished. So they believed him until the moment when he was about to marry the princess and, and the ceremony was just about to start. And a little person in, in African name is Dede. 
If you're Zulu, you know, you'd know what is Dede. I, I better not explain what it is in English. It's a bit embarrassing. So a little person start talking and say, what happened to the food? You ate all of it. And then starting to narrate all of the food that was in, in the basket and, and came back, had tried to kill this thing and, and, and broke it like people kill whistleblowers, like people uh, uh, fire whistleblowers. And he had actually done that. He had beaten it up, chopped it into pieces, and buried it in the sand, and he thought that was the end of it. But it was one of those things that regroup, rec uh, rec uh, 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 and, and, and regenerates, and it came back to haunt him. So why am I telling the story of Gimba? That again, when we're looking at education technologies, we should build the stories into those technologies, whether in movies, whether in games, um, so that the young ones can learn whilst playing. In terms of the broader frameworks of what education is supposed to do, one of the things we have learned in doing the enterprising communities things is that you can take about six different sustainable development goals and do one thing. As you're designing the technology, it can be about the environment, it can be about providing jobs, it could be education. So the, a whole lot of things could be done by just doing one thing. And um, you can educate children how to do gardening, uh, um, domestic gardening, what do they call it, urban gardening, the one where they use uh, tires, old tires, and then they just uh, put little soil, and that becomes a lesson in saving the environment, but at the same time, it's about nutrition, as we're talking about children who are growing stunted, 28% children grown, growing with stunted brains because of lack of proper nutrition. So this could answer that. It could answer the environment, could answer play, play. It could provide a whole lot of things that we would like to be done. Dear colleagues, in terms of the next chapter, uh, Africa needs to consciously clarify the why for its education, as that will determine how and what understanding that technology can act as a midwife or a saboteur of the Africa we want. I mean, and just in short is, if we don't have the why, we will design technologies. But those technologies will end up with those scary movies where the technology is more harmful than helpful. But also you could have technology that is helpful in one sector but destroys other things. So it becomes important that we have integrative reasoning as we design these things. The world we yearn for depends on our next steps. I believe we don't have a lot of time. I believe we don't have until 2063 to align education with our needs. Be, it, be they social justice or social economic inclusion, or be they the environment. We don't have that time. I'll even believe that 2030 is a bit far. But hey, I'm preaching to the choir. Let's do this. Thank you.